Hi, I'm Paul Kasabian, I'm a structural engineer, and we've been talking about loads and structures. Now, if there was a situation... Hi, I'm Paul Kas... Hi, I'm Paul Kasabian, I'm a structural engineer, and we've been talking about structures and loads. So if we know there's going to be a load on the structure that we're designing, couldn't we do something in advance to prepare for that? Yes, it's called pre-stressing. And when we most see pre-stressing is in concrete structures because concrete is good in compression, weak in tension. You know what's also good in compression and weak in tension? A pack of cards. Here they are, incredibly good in compression and really not good at all in tension, right? So if we have a situation like this and we would like to do something in advance, we could take something that we can put tension into, like this elastic band, do some work in advance, this is me doing some work and putting some energy into the system, and now we've got a structure ready for some future loads. This structure kind of looks the same as it did before, but the difference being is that there's now tension in the elastic band and there's compression in the cards, and that compression and tension are equal. So if in the future, as there's about to be for me, some tension that gets applied to the concrete cards, let's say, then as that tension happens, yeah, you're not seeing anything, right? That's a good thing. Because right now as I'm pulling on the cards, what I'm doing is reducing the compression that was in the cards. They haven't separated yet. I'm putting tension into the system. That tension is going actually into the elastic bands through the, through the cards. And the cards are going into less compression. And then as I keep going, once I've reached the level of tension that was equal to the, uh, to the compression that was in the cards, now the cards separate. Right. So that's great because I was just doing those future loads and we preset the system to help against those future loads. Now with concrete beams and floors, what we often do is that tension is applied inside the concrete beam or floor to protect the tendons that are gonna have the tension in them. So let's look at some different ways that we can do that. So let's take a beam. We're going to put a tension cable through the middle. Remember it's going to be red for tension and then blue for compression. Here we have a little bit of tension in the cable. As we increase it slowly, here we go, and there we are. We've got more tension in the cable. It's running right through the middle of this beam, and we've got compression in that beam. Great. Okay, well, in this scenario, with no weight on the beam, we have that green line that just appeared. We have no bending moment, right? For some reason, nothing's happening to this beam. If we add weight to the beam, there we go, the beam deflects a bit, we get the classic bending moment diagram that we've discussed before, and if we add more weight, a bigger bending moment diagram. So what's the benefit of this? Well, some benefit of this particular approach is that we now have, for these weights, less tension than we normally would in the beam, here at the sort of middle, lower part of the beam, than if we did not have that tension tendon in place. So, that's somewhat of a win, given that, as these typically are in concrete structures and we're trying to reduce tension uh, in, in the concrete, that's somewhat a lot of a win. Not a great win. So what can we do that's better? Well, instead of having that tension tie, tension cable along the middle of the centroid of the beam, how about we lower it? Okay, well, how might that help us? Let's see. Let's increase the tension in this beam. You can see it's starting to rise up because that tension cable is lower than the centroid, so it's lifting up that beam. And in this particular case, with no weight added, we now have a constant bending moment in this beam, right? This is, this is really the equivalent of grabbing the ends of a beam and racking them up, like putting a bending moment at either end. Except instead of having to do that externally to a beam, what we're doing, if I go back, is we're doing it essentially internal to the beam itself by having this tension lower than the centroid. So this becomes our starting point if we have the tension tendon lower in the beam. That means as we add weight to the 
uh, beam, we still get the same shape bending moment, but what we've managed to achieve is we've raised that shape of bending moment higher up because we've given it this initial starting point. So that means if we compare the two, at the top is what we had before and at the bottom is what we have now, we have a lower bending moment for the same loads than when we had the tension tendon in the middle. So that's an improvement to what we had before, right? We had a first step up here, this is a second step. So surely we can do better because the frustrating thing in all of this is that we have these loads and sometimes we know what these loads will be quite specifically, but we've got this sort of frustrating bending moment shape that we want to do something about. So how about we curve the shape of the tendon, right? The bending moment diagram's curved, let's curve the tendon. So here it is, sort of starts somewhere, I'm showing it in the middle, but it, more importantly, it drapes down to the bottom. And as we increase the tension in that, can you see what's happening? That beam is ra rising up because, well, of course it has to, because we've got sort of an internal force below its centroid here. So that's quite interesting. And then, and this is wildly exaggerated, of course, the way I'm showing it for effect, we starting this with no external loads, with an inbuilt bending moment, but because that tendon was draped, as we call it in pre-stressing, because it was draped, we have a curved bending moment in the opposite direction. Okay, this is good. It's good because as we add load, that reduces, but it kind of reduces from a curve to less of a curve. And in fact, if we get it just right, meaning the right uh, tendon profile, and we know the loads that are going to come on in the right tension, that can happen. We can get loads sitting on a beam with a draped tendon profile with the right tension, shown in red, where we're back to a horizontal green line, meaning zero bending moment in a beam that's spanning, that's carrying load all because we preset it. We were proactive in a way to deal with this situation. And this profile of the, of the tendon is called a concordant profile. It's a fancy word for basically saying, hey, we basically draped it in the shape of the bending moment that would be produced for those loads, right? And if we compare this to an analogy from an earlier video that I did with you guys, that we sh I showed you a tied arch, remember this? So we have a self-contained system of a correctly shaped compressive arch that under loads has, is balanced with a horizontal tension tie. And in this, and in the lower case with the uh, concordant profile of a tendon, we've got the analogous opposite of it because we have a shaped, draped, curved tension member that is self-balanced with a compressive member going horizontally. These two, it's a very powerful analogy, this, a tight arch and a concordant profile on a pre-stressed beam. They are the same. People often think of these as wildly different things, arches and pre-stressed beams. They're really not. This is the same kind of behavior and they are self-contained structural systems. So what does this mean in practicality? Okay, here's an example of a bridge girder, a very long span bridge girder. So there's a few things we can see here. First of all, those are the uh, ends of the tendons here. There's quite a few because I've shown you for example and understanding just one red line. We don't have to have just one, right? We can have many. And then what we tend to have here, and this is, relates to both benefits of structure and also fitting things together, we may run a bunch of lower ones horizontally down the length of the girder. And then because we want ones that are draped, those ones will be these higher ones, right? They'll come up and they'll be uh, terminated at the end. They'll drape down, down, down the girder. They won't go all the way to the bottom, not because we don't want to, just because there'll be the other tendons that are coming across horizontally here. They'll drape down and they'll go back up, oops, to the end, ignore that. And they'll go back up to the end. And uh, that's also caused this girder, you can see that curve just here, that here is just lifted as well, right? So this has lifted up the girder. So what are the benefits here? We can do longer spans than otherwise. We can do uh, either shallower beams or floors for the same span as normal. 
And then the benefit of these is specifically for structures where you're not going to do anything else to them anymore, right? So a bridge or uh, beams or floors of a hotel or a residential building. And by not doing anything to them, I mean cutting holes in the beams or the floors, right? You don't typically cut holes in the beams of a bridge um, after it's installed or in a parking garage. And you typically, when you've got a hotel or residential building, that layout's all pretty fixed. Very different, for example, to say an office building where people might want to put internal stairs and bounce all over the place and make changes so you get different kinds of tenants for different use. So you can do a highly optimized structure as long as you then leave it alone. And the reason you want to leave pre-stressed structures alone, don't forget, is there's a lot of tension in these. Going back to those cards, remember this? Yeah, that sounded a lot and sounded <laughs> quite a, a big volume of sound there. That's representative of the amount of energy that's built into these tendons. You never want to cut these tendons unless you mean to and you've totally planned for it, right? Okay, that's it, and that's pre-stressing.